All right, so I want to just start the uh, panel with a basic premise. That is that learning poverty is just as detrimental as monetary poverty, which you know many experts are using lots of very fancy quantitative measures to tell you is true. Learning poverty, um, in the way defined, is being unable to read and understand a simple text by age 10. And basically, all this means is that poor children are more likely to be learning poor. If they are more likely to be learning poor, they have less um, economic opportunities, social opportunities, political opportunities, and are limited in the way that monetary poverty would do so. So what does that tell us? In addition to foundation literacy, foundational literacy and numeracy, limiting uh, quality educational outcomes, we know there's a link between foundational literacy and the health of the education system. In addition to that, we know that there's a link between foundational literacy and numeracy and the economic growth of a nation, the economic health of a nation. But we go further than that, and we say that there's an issue around wealth inequality, and we want to be able to alleviate that as well. So it's not just about economic growth and growing the um, GDP and, and various other economic indicators, but also our ability to close the gap on wealth inequality. So in, since this conference is about the Indian economy, if we look at India, we start to look more closely at foundational literacy. In India, we find 55% of late primary age children suffering from learning poverty. And if we go uh, looking at the COVID pandemic years, there's estimates that 92% of children were losing some sort of um, reading ability during that period. So we've reversed some of our progress in this area. We have a lot to catch up on. So the IFC report that we were just um, uh, talking about has language as an instrument to fight against poverty in the new education policy. And I just want to give us a little bit of context and start by understanding what is needed for children to have a comprehensive literacy experience. So to begin with, we recognize literacy is actually a pretty amazing human feat, right? We learn to read text, and at the same time, we're making meaning while we're reading text. So there's this balance between fluency and comprehension. As I become more fluent, I'm going to comprehend more. As I comprehend more, I'm going to become more fluent. Um, and that balance is necessary as you're teaching a child to read. So the ability to make meaning is a function of increased fluency. But the opposite is also true. Reading with fluency, that's your speed, your accuracy, your ability to have the right expressions as you're reading are a function of increased comprehension. So we're, we're looking to, feed, to build that balance in curriculum that we're developing. So in this, in this area of what children need, particularly in the Indian context, the most obvious hurdle is that children in India um, need to learn in a language that they're familiar with in their early years. And so orality the link between home language and language in the classroom is really important. Secondly, the child needs exposure to um, language materials that they're familiar with. And the most obvious hurdle then in, is that in, children in India are not equally prepared for school. Pre-literacy skills may not be being built at the same levels in their home because there may not be print at home or you may have low literacy levels at home. So what does a structured pedagogical approach look like? I've just got a slide up here to give you a sense of some of the components. And you know, for, for many of the practitioners who are building programs in this space, this is sort of what we're looking at to structure pedagogy in our programs. And that includes the scope and sequence of the language and being able to learn um, letters, uh, words, sentences in parallel. So am I able to teach the child the most commonly used consonant vowel combinations quickly, so they can start building words quickly, building sentences quickly, et cetera. The importance of lesson plans and teacher guides that are very practical for teachers that are not using a lot of jargon, that help a teacher build very effective, simple um, engagement with her students on a regular basis. Coaching, not just professional development, but on-site coaching. So having state governments have cadres of mentors for teachers. 
Um, and of course, data systems, monitoring systems, et cetera, which you know, a, a report like this one tells us a lot about the importance of those types of measures. The other nuances in the Indian context, I think important for us to keep in mind as we're thinking through the complexities. Because Indian languages are akshara-based scripts, um, the automaticity is required at both the akshara and the text level. So you've got 400 or so consonant vowel combinations, right, that you're expecting children to decode as they're reading. So as you're developing curriculum, the awareness, phonological awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, have to be split out into lessons that are paced appropriately, but don't overload children. Of course, there's also the shortage of dedicated FLN teachers, and that's an issue that we have to focus on to ensure that the trainings are effective, specifically in the context of India, where we have multi-grade, multi-language classrooms. Quality reading materials, a dearth of those in local languages, but it's important to not just be creating them. You need procurement systems, distribution systems to get these materials out across the states and countries at scale. We talked about the importance of learning in a familiar language first, but parents and communities also need to be made aware that young children who acquire strong foundational literacy skills in their home language will be able to learn other languages, English included, better, faster in the future. So despite these various challenges, lots of challenges, there has been quite a lot of progress and successful interventions in foundational literacy, many by um, NGOs, but at limited scale. But we are seeing some very strong examples of going to scale when we're able to work with government systems and we have the leadership we need from the government system to scale up. And I just have one quick example from our work that is also highlighted in the IFC report. So since 2015, Room to Read has been implementing a project known as the Scaling Up Early Reading Intervention, which is supported by USAID. And it's a large-scale comprehensive early grade literacy project. Across, it started across four states, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Uttarakhand, and Uttar Pradesh, reaching 300,000 children across 2,600 primary schools. We've just added two more states this past year, Telangana and Rajasthan. And the key components under the project are explicit reading and writing instruction, um, reading material that focuses on that balance between fluency and comprehension that I mentioned, child-friendly libraries with regular reading activities, dedicated time for reading instruction, time built in for practice is incredibly important as children are learning to read, and teacher training as well as monitoring and assessment. And the program is designed with an I do, we do, you do approach that mirrors the way we want teachers to work with students. So in the I do model, Room to Read is demonstrating the program. In the we do model, we're working directly with the state government, releasing some responsibility into the system. And then finally, with the you do model, the state government is implementing completely on its own with our technical assistance and support. And the first two phases have been completed. We're in the midst of the third. But you see the results are quite promising. So we had an evaluation of the demonstration phase conducted in 2015 to 2017 in Chhattisgarh and Uttarakhand, and then an evaluation of the partnership phase between 2016 and 2018. And in both cases, we had effect sizes between 1.3 and 1.5 standard deviations, which is quite considerably substantial for these types of projects, and basically translates to fluency rates in program schools that are two times that of comparison schools. So now the time is right. There's an enabling environment due to the national education policy and Nipun Bharat to make transformational changes. And of course, additional budget allocations being made in this area to continue to support that. So we'll now have this opportunity to work together, all of us as stakeholders, to keep the momentum going. And that's what we're going to hear more about during the course of this panel. And in the context of the foundation literacy and numeracy report being released by the IFC, and supported by USAID and Room to Read, we'll get to hear some insights from practitioners who've been working in education, like Arundhati from Mentor Together, from um, Karen, uh, who is working with USAID, and they've invested quite a lot in literacy initiatives all over the world, 
and of course from Pavan Ji, who has tremendous experience conceptualizing, managing, and implementing projects, and from Asha, who's been working in the education space for a considerable number of years in India. So you'll have this opportunity to hear their insights, and hopefully we'll keep the momentum going around education. So with that, we're going to start talking with our panelists here. All right, so Asha, you're mic'd right. Okay. Maybe you can start just by telling us a little bit about your experience in education and just given some of the themes we're talking about today, where do you think that we as a collective community should be focusing to continue to make improvements? So I think my first uh, sort of adventure in education, I'm actually a venture capitalist and now a philanthropist. We run a family foundation that is focused on uh, entrepreneurship, bringing entrepreneurship into uh, disadvantaged areas where there, you know, there aren't. The, my first dabbling in uh, kind of seeing how we could accelerate kids who are problem solving in their community was we started, we hosted something called the Maker Festival in India. And uh, we had thousands of people showing up from across the country, young people from anywhere from age six to 25. And uh, we would pick out of those, we would pick about 20 people, bring them to Silicon Valley and accelerate whatever they were doing. Uh, but that was, I mean, I see that as part of their own learning journey and how we could not just you know, accelerate the projects they were working on, but also enable them to think about learning in a different manner. We had a lot of kids that did drop out of high school <laughs> and do successful projects and uh, actually create livelihood out of that. So this was very promising for me. But uh, my, my first real adventure in sort of learning as you guys are speaking about it is, is on school in the cloud. And uh, I had worked with uh, Professor Shugata Mitra, who was a TED Prize winner at, mm -hmm. uh, at TED. He had worked on, those of you who are in India, you probably know about Professor Mitra's work called Hole in the Wall, which he had, uh, where he had put a computer in, uh, you know, in, in the concrete while it was still setting in, under a freeway in, 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 I think, in New Delhi. And uh, the kids were just, I mean, children of the construction workers who were playing around there were were playing with this computer. And what they, and they taped all this and they discovered in a, that in a year, they, the kids le learned how to do search on their own, they learned English, and there was, there was just phenomenal results achieved by simply having this computer, with access to this computer. So out of that, uh, Professor Mitra had actually developed something called School in the Cloud, which I also adopted. And we got this sort of the internet we put in a two terabyte box. And we deployed it actually in uh, pretty terror-ridden parts of, of Pakistan, mm. because I wanted to bring that kind of education, uh, and just learning, actually. So we had the internet in a box in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and some of those regions where there was a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of um, uh, I would say, a lot of power of the clergy. And I was surprised to see that the clergy was quite happy to have this box that we were saying. And we were working with a group in Karachi called Spotcom. Mm -hmm. It was a, a local ISP. So it, because it was easy for us to then deploy it in, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. But the, what we learned is that irrespective of whether this was in India or Pakistan or wherever, if kids had access to the internet, even if they didn't know English, actually it made a lot of difference without having teachers who knew English. So this these are all pretty radical, disruptive learnings from this project and this experiment that Shugata did. They have data for all this. It's all, you know, if you look at school in the cloud, it's, it's all there. And there's something called the Soul Kit, S-O-L-E, Soul Kit that one can download from TED.com, which gives you the whole template on how to do this on your own. And we had another one set up in Ahmedabad in a, an all-girls school. The results were phenomenal. Kids learned English and math. Uh, in, a, in a way in which we had never expected. So, so I think that was my first experience. And I, so I, I am a truly, I'm a believer in this whole idea of kind of privatizing and decentralizing learning through the edge nodes. It doesn't have to be centralized. And uh, how does one make this happen? There are tons of NGOs in India, literally thousands of NGOs now, that actually go into the slum. Mm -hmm. and, they, uh, and they enable learning in, their, in the children's environment where they are. So they don't have to be going to uh, you know, specific construction sites and so on. So the, the results are phenomenal. How this can be scaled and systematized, I don't know. But uh, that's, that's the big question. I think it, 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 in the report, and I mean, if you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong in quoting this, but I think it's like 40% of schools have computers and only 25% are on the internet. 
um, in India. So if, if that's the case, this, this digital divide is an interesting question, right, in terms of where the governments are going to go in terms of their own investments in technology and public systems. And, you know, we can talk a little bit about that. And then I think there's a lot of learnings out of the pandemic period as well yes. with um, the use of low-tech interventions like the radio and television and, and other things like that uh, to get to the, to the margins, as you say. Um, so maybe with that, and with you, I know you have some experience working with a number of age ranges, and maybe you can just share a little bit about your work first and, and tell us some of your reflections on what you've heard so far. Sure. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, and congratulations to Richard and Amit for putting together such an uh, eclectic group and also a day of so much insight. Uh, I'm Arundhati Gupta. I'm a social entrepreneur. I'm based in Bangalore, but I, I've also recently started spending more time in the Bay Area. Um, I co-founded Mentor Together, which is a youth mentorship nonprofit organization that works across India. Um, if I can bring up the slides, I have three ideas to share from my work at Mentor Together to this very, very important uh, topic of, of foundational learning. Um, so just moving ahead, I think the, to the oh, sorry, it's with me. <laughs> Um, so a lot of our work at Mentor Together as a mentorship organization is, is on this very, very simple premise that every aspect of human development is fundamentally shaped by interpersonal relationships. The people who we have around us, the people who we know, the kind of nurture they provide us, the kind of guidance, the inspiration, sometimes even consoling us in difficult times, those types of relationships become so vital in in all our lives, so consequential in many ways in terms of what we do in our lives. And especially for young people who come from backgrounds of social or economic disadvantage, they can often be the differentiator between whether someone gets the right information and advice or, no, or gets the right support when they really need it. Um, so building on this idea of mentorship and how is, uh, our, our work has really looked at ensuring that mentorship is central to the education experience. We don't see it as very different from formal learning. We see that it's something that young people have to be supported through. And um, just as a little bit of context before I move on, uh, in the last four years, a lot of our work has taken on a digital shape um, in looking at mentorship uh, through an entirely digital program for young women and men in universities. So we work with over three state governments. We've developed a digital mentoring platform. We have over 35,000 mentors and mentees on it. So I'll speak to some of my learnings from that. That could be uh, three ideas from all of my work that I think could be helpful for this, for this topic of foundational learning. Um, so the first one is just the opportunity when we think of foundational learning for us to set it as the base and the starting point for gender transformative education. Um, and why is that so important? Right? Research shows that children start gaining insight into cultural gender stereotypes from as early as ages two and three. They can start demonstrating behavior that's then stereotyped or prejudiced from as, age, from as early as age three or four. Um, in our work in tertiary, and this, this sort of, these things that start this early only get more entrenched as age goes on. In our work in tertiary education today, the number one challenge that we're trying to solve is that why are there equal numbers of young women in universities, but only 30% of them go on to work, which is, a, which is a problem that we discussed. Rohini shared a lot about it in, in two, two panels before. And we realized that you can solve for a skills deficit, you can address a network gap, but the hardest thing to change have been gender norms and social norms, which kick in so much in India to say that after the age of 18 or 21, um, the role of a woman primarily becomes that of a provider, of someone who should look at her family and the needs of the family rather than be economically providing. And so I asked myself that, imagine if we could start solving that problem when young people, when, when they were children, when they were two or three, right? The, the, the length of time we have to actually set the right gender norms and ensure that then those things don't become something that we're trying to just through other ways solved. So I think that's the first idea I'd like to share, that foundational learning is really the place where we have to start gender transformative education. And what that means is often moving from um, curricula and ped there's a continuum of educational pedagogy when you think of gender transformative of education, and you can start from being gender blind to gender neutral to gender sensitive, but what you need to be is gender responsive, which means that you don't have, to, a lot of educational curricula is not stereotyped or is, does not have bias or prejudice in it. But what it means is that today, knowing what's the situation in India, it has to very actively address 
what's happening. It has to, so I, I recall an anecdote which if you take a book, from, if you take one of the, the early education uh, textbooks, there's a really nice story of a boy who's peeling peas and helping his mom in the kitchen. Now that's a great, that's a great uh, way to be gender sensitive because you're not showing the girl in the kitchen. But to take it further, why should it be the woman in the kitchen? Why, why is his mother in the kitchen? Why can't it be showing that the role of a man is also in the kitchen, right? So in and those ways, making sure that you're really thinking of how to tackle some of these inequalities that, that emerge in India's society through uh, early learning. The second idea that I'd like to share, um, and this comes from work, uh, Sometimes I feel I run a technology company and sometimes I feel I run a not-for-profit because we've ended up building so much of mentoring technology for us to use. Um, and I think technology in education has seen a rapid increase, um, especially because of school closures during COVID and, and what that meant. And like Geeta mentioned, it was also a lot of uh, TV and also a lot of radio, but uh, a lot of apps, a lot of different types of inter interventions have come up. Um, if I could add what I think, and technology can do so many things, right? You could be putting teaching learning material onto it. Um, you could be putting more types of training for teachers itself. The one thing that we've learned is most important, if you could address through technology, is this idea of helping the helper. So what, what's called in digital health and mental health interventions as supportive accountability. The fact that the person on the front line often in India in early education, the Anganwadi teacher, right? Or, or a, a parent who's coming from a low-resourced environment doesn't really know what to do but has to provide that care for their child. They don't often have the skills and the knowledge to do the right thing at the right time. So if technology can provide those kinds of very paired support to ensure that the person on the ground is, has that, it's almost like a buddy, it's almost like a coach, and, and interventions that do that have found to have much greater effect than if uh, the helper is left with technology and left to figure it out on their, on their own. So I think the idea of supportive accountability and coaching and nudging the person on the ground through technology is, is what I'd, I'd hope is an idea we take ahead and, and really scale. And for us in mentoring, it has meant um, some fairly low-tech things like you've said, Geeta. It's not, everything is not an app. We've had to create, for every mentor-mentee group, a WhatsApp group, because that's the way, and India runs on WhatsApp, everyone knows that, that's the way we can actually get you know, real-time information to help the mentor make the right decisions when they're mentoring. So imagine if we could do that for the Anganwadi teacher or a parent. That's the second idea I would put, put forward. Um, and then the final idea that I put forward, because I um, really enjoyed reading through the report, the very multi-stakeholder approach that is there to early education today, including in the national education policy. It envisages a big role for business and government and, and civil society. Um, from the business side, like it was mentioned, India has a very, very interesting corporate social responsibility law that mandates 2% of net profits being spent. Um, and in the seven years that it's been there, over a trillion rupees has been put into the development sector because of that. So we have a lot of funding coming from the business side. What I'd say, what I found very helpful in my work at Mentor Together is taking a very shared value approach to working with business. Don't just take the money from them, but really think how this problem relates to their problem and what they need to do for that. Um, a, a statistic I use very frequently with, with business leaders when I speak to them is this uh, statistic from the Energy Project, which says that only 36% 30, 30, of workers worldwide find meaning and significance in their work. So they're looking for opportunities to do more than just what their work entails. And can businesses look at that opportunity to give their employees a chance to sit, uh, to sit at the, a seat at the table for important issues for India? So we look at the opportunity to build leadership, sensitivity, empathy through volunteering. Mm -hmm. And I think that's um, also one key idea that the that is there in early education, uh, the Vidyanjali project, which is trying to ensure that schools are actively connected to volunteers. And I'd say that's something we've seen incredible success with, with Mentor Together's initiatives. We work with over 40 companies um, to ensure that, and this is in the context of tertiary education, but I can easily see it being also done in early education. But to really say that this is investment you're doing in your own human capital that you're going to see, whether it's three years down the line or 20 years down the line, 
So how do you start actively getting yourself and the, your human capital, which is your employees, involved in solving this issue from day one? Um, so the, yes, those are three ideas I'd like to share. Those are wonderful. Thank you. If you can actually pass over to Karen, um, I think your I think your slides are in there next. Um, I, oh. So, so we, maybe you can chat a little bit about USAID and sort of the um, portfolio that you've had. I know that you've invested quite heavily in literacy projects all over the world in India as well, and um, something like 24 million children, I believe, just in 2020 alone across 50 countries benefiting from projects that have been supported by USAID. Just given some of the themes you've heard, what are you all seeing in your portfolio? What do you think for this audience as we kind of look to the future we should be focused on? Great, thank you, Gita. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today. I am Karen Klamowski, and I'm with the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID. I've been working in international development for over 30 years in a variety of sectors, from public health to renewable energy to democracy and governance to education, um, a jack of all trades in international development. And I, we value our partnership with the government of India, with organizations like Room to Read, with Institute of Sustainable um, oh, I'm gonna, uh, Competitiveness, sorry, Institute for Competitiveness. It's what makes us successful. I think as we sat through all of the lessons, uh, what we heard today, you know, we can all agree that numeracy and literacy is a foundation. And teaching the younger kids the basic skills so that they can succeed throughout their school year and then turn into the workforce is one of the most important things that we can do. We, um, we at USAID India, we really work closely to support India's national education policy, the Nipun Bharat. And we're partnering with the government and organizations like Room to Read to do curriculum development, teacher training. Uh, we set up libraries in local schools, in local languages for students to learn. One of the unintended consequences of COVID is we also drew parents into the library. So parents that weren't previously reading saw their kids checking out books and reading them at home when the, when the school was disrupted. And they started reading, and they started learning, and they, they were able to, to learn to read. Um, we engage parents to support their, their children's learning and build the capacity of the management committees, and also increasing local government body support for education. We look at a holistic approach to improve the reading outcomes and really create that foundation for, um, for the basic numeracy and literacy. So development organizations and the US government, we have a few lessons learned that we've learned not only in India, but implementing our education programs throughout the world. First, we recognize that it's really important to partner together and to bring together a broad array of partners. We at USA do not have all the answers and far from it. So we work with organizations, NGOs, mentors together. Um, we work with government bodies. We work at academia to do reports, such as the one that we released today. Um, and that's really to help us develop a common understanding and to reach those shared goals and to create better programs and to adapt those programs as we move forward so we can take from the research reports that we have, adapt it, and implement better programs. We, as USAID and the US government, can play a catalytic role in convening these partners. As the US government, we're able to speak with the Indian government, coordinate closely with them, and bring introduce, introduce partners that haven't traditionally worked together to come into the space and create a, a leverage more power into numeracy and literacy. We also must focus on sustainable impact. How do we make these programs more meaningful and sustained over the, out of the long term. How do we create a system where students will stay in school, where they're excited to learn, they're given an environment where they want to learn and they want to continue their education, and where we break down norms and barriers so, that, so if their parents or they support the children's learning and they see the reason for it and moving it into the future. We are working on policy development, working with states to develop vision and joint action plans to implement and monitor foundation, um, foundational learning and numeracy programs. 
And I think the systems level approach really fosters more consistent and effective outcomes throughout the states. We are also working to, the report will show different states achieving different mm -hmm. areas. So we're looking at how do we take the best practices, creating a community of best practices. How do we take the best practices from one state and bring them to another state to be implemented and to test it in that state so we can, we can have greater development outcomes. We also at USAID look at inclusive and locally led development approach. So we look in the, we're rooted in the belief that every person is instrumental in transforming their societies. And we must look at communities to look at solutions and help develop those solutions. We prize the knowledge of people in those communities, respect their expertise, and engage them as partners rather than beneficiaries. For education, that can mean ensuring that an innovative learning materials and programs are available in multiple languages through a wide variety of accessible platforms and focus towards communities and groups. We also feel it's very important of inclusion, to talk about inclusion. We heard about it today, women in the workforce. We've heard about it in the panel. Um, just spoke highly about it. And through all of our programs, we take special care to expand access to education for women and girls. And looking at materials that are um, that are gender neutral or gender transformative, that start breaking down those gender norms um, and the barriers to, to accessing education. And I'll just share a couple of stories. I recently went to Uttarakhand, and I was able to visit one of our programs that we're implementing with Room to Read there. And I met a young student named Rita. And she was telling me that she was terrified to go to school, her older sister had a horrible experience in school, was berated, she wasn't learning. Um, she came home crying every day from being in the classroom. So Rita didn't want to go to school at all. And luckily, she got into school. She went to a school that we had been working in with Room to Read, where we had implemented, we had done teacher training programs, we had done professional development. We created one of the reading libraries there where they had the access to read and they had dedicated times to read. And Rita um, saw the books. She started getting really involved in the book. She loved the book. She loved the colorful of the book. She brought the books home. Her mother started reading. Her father started reading. She was teaching them to read, as they also weren't reading. And it really um, sparked her curiosity. And she told me when I met her, she's become a star reader in the top of her class. And in her own words, she said, I love coming to school every day. My teachers help me learn in a very fun way. I want to become a teacher like them one day so I can help others in reading and learning. And for us, that's part of why we do our work. While this is just one story, we can extrapolate it and bring it across and know that it's applied throughout all the areas where we work. And just another example I want to bring in, which is tied to some of the earlier panels that we're working on. We are working in micro and small enterprise development in India as well. And I had the, I had the opportunity to travel to Madurai and um, Tamil Nadu recently and then drove to Kerala from there. And in that trip, I visited um, a women's cooperative that we've established with over 6,800 women. And these women are from the tribal communities, had always worked in the informal sector. We've created, um, we partnered with a group called Industry, which is based mm -hmm. in Bengaluru. And then um, we've created, these women all own their, or this business now. And what they're doing is harvesting banana bark and bamboo fiber for all the way from planting the fields, growing the bamboo trees, growing the banana, um, the banana trees, harvesting the bark, drying the bark, processing the bark, turning it into rope, and now um, making it into products. And while we do that kind of skilling all the time, sometimes what we lack is creating a market for the product. So we were able to create a market to IKEA, Care for Target, we're in talks with Walmart. And these 6,800 women have, sent, have sold over $2 million worth of products to IKEA in the last year. And now why is this important? When I met with the women, they all talked. We also started bringing in gender-based violence training and gender training to them. 
they all started talking to me about how their husbands were not supportive of them working in the workforce. Now their husbands, most of them, who were also in the informal sector, have quit their jobs to support their wives. Their wives are working less than eight hours a day and actually went from making about 2,000 rupees a month to 25,000 rupees a month and working from 16 hour days to now about six hour days. They've taken that money and putting the money into their children's education. They all talk about how important their children's education was and how they have both their girl child and their boy child now working doing household chores, which in the past had never happened and they would keep their girl child from school. So when we talk about a holistic approach, mm -hmm. I think these are extremely important as well to create those opportunities and start breaking down the gender norms from the parents down to the kids as well. So with that, um, I will leave it and I will say that some of the work we're doing in India and with the government, I think are, is really innovative and can serve as models that we can replicate and take to other countries in the world as well, particularly in African countries where, where there's a lot more to do in numeracy and literacy. So thank you. It's, it's fascinating that development agencies have been moving towards system strengthening more broadly, and you made the point around local ownership, and with that, I think it's um, uh, sort of the right moment to invite Nal Pavanji to address all of you. You're representing, I mean, systems that are serving 250 million children, 1.5 million public schools, and um, the, the Economic Advisory Council um, of the PM's office. And so I'll invite you just to share a little bit about your thoughts, particularly given the complexity and the state structure around education and sort of what the scorecard means and what do we do with all this information? <laughs> so uh, good evening, everyone. My presentation is based on these, uh, this report only, and uh, I will be going through uh, this presentation on the basis of the school, teacher, and child. Basically, I will be talking about the major challenges and way forward. So how to improve access to edu school education. Uh, so importance of education is for economic growth, social justice, equality, scientific advancement, national integration, and cultural preservation. That was but requirement of a school in future. As uh, uh, Vivek sir mentioned during his conversation that we will be having uh, less school in future. Uh, you can see the largest share of age five 24 in uh, India 2011, mm -hmm. but uh, in 2036, this percentage of total population shift to 2044. Uh, so major challenges related to access is uh, improvement of uh, SDI index, uh, gross enrollment ratio, annual drop mm -hmm. uh, dropout rate, retention rate, which uh, Arundhati was also mentioned. Uh, total number of children in three to nine years, uh, you can say you are talking about the Anganwadis, but number of children not enrolled is uh, it can be seen here in pre-primary enrollment and enrollment in grade one, two, three. Still, we have large number to uh, check. And the most important accessibility of uh, children with the special need, that is also declining in enrollment of children with in uh, states uh, uh, marks or uh, um, numbers can be seen also. So future trend is, as mentioned in the uh, morning session also, the share of India's zero to 19 population on decline, and overall number of school-going children will decline by 18.4% between 2011 to 2041. Uh, and uh, nations like Japan, China, South Korea, Singapore, Canada, with similar trends have already begun. So now uh, the major uh, issue with the, this new education policy is that we should bring back all out of school children, prevent dropouts, achieve 100% GR at all levels, and all the state and UT government to innovatively group or rationalize schools. That is the main motto, and these are the innovative practices from states. Like Bihar is talking about Pravet Savjisme, uh, in, in that uh, uh, scheme they are uh, by through street play, Prabhat ferries, they are encouraging students to come. JNK and Ladakh, uh, they are residential schools, facilities for nomadic children, and community involvement is also uh, uh, visible there. Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, Uttar Pradesh, they are talking about infrastructure. They are developing, uh, they are creating uh, infrastructure in schools so that to 
uh, get more and more uh, students in the school. Gujarat and Karnataka, they are talking about, they are taking initiatives to attendance assessment through Vidya Samiksha Kendra and uh, uh, student achievement tracking system. So uh, way forward in action, this monitor enrollment dropouts and retention at each level, is, uh, each school level, and overall state and district level monitoring only gives average picture. So we'll have to review school buildings and, uh, and requirements and improve GR and reduce dropout rates. Uh, for uh, uh, number of zero six year old child to be left, uh, no uh, zero to six year old child to be left behind. That uh, ratio we have already seen, and tap the brain development phase of every child up to age six. That should be our plan way forward for uh, access to uh, education. This focus on learning recovery, clear cut strategy will have to make end to end tracking of every child from preschool to higher education through hundred percent student registry. That should be uh, mainstream out of school children, and we'll have to identify infrastructural gaps. So uh, community involvement through Vidyanjali, as you have mentioned, to augment the uh, digital and physical infrastructure, and again, uh, uh, to, cap to, make, uh, to uh, develop the capacity building. And Manodarpan initiative focus on mental and physical health and, uh, and well-being of child. That is the main focus of national education policy also. Uh, teachers as a transformer, again, major challenges are, so we can see that the status of vacancies in academic post in uh, all the uh, state level and district level uh, education institutes. Uh, status of substandard teacher education institutes, even we have then also substandard teacher education institutes are there, then we'll, we cannot uh, uh, develop our own strategy. Teachers vacancies, you can see elementary level, it's, most of the states don't have uh, teachers. Uh, uh, that is in high secondary level. And uh, the most important right to education compliant pupil teacher ratio is also very problematic, very sorry figures we can see. Single teacher schools still uh, are running in remote areas in, uh, in most of the states that can be seen in this report. So uh, poor quality programs and outcome and unavailability of trained teachers, most important uh, factor, which uh, uh, we can say that suboptimal teachers recruitment process, lack of individualization in training. So training is also very much important uh, for teachers. And this talks about, uh, uh, that's why uh, National Education Policy 2020 is very much important because they, it is covering all the areas, instructions, flow of resources, teaching, goals, technology, policy, administration, and engagements. Uh, so innovative practices from states, again, for teachers, uh, all the states are uh, now in competition to uh, take some you know, innovative, to develop uh, some strategies. Teachers as transformer way forward. I will talk about uh, review quality of teachers education institutions because every time we are talking about major challenges, but need to focus on quality, qualitative pre-services education to equip teachers with the capacity to implement new education policy. Strengthen in service teacher education, adopt professional standards for teachers and institu institutionalized mentoring. Uh, recruitment to be based on projections and uh, provide tools to teachers for the purpose of self-appraisal. Uh, that should be in BRC, CRC, and DIES during consultations. And way forward for providing trained teachers to every school is the foremost responsibility of a state and UT. Provide teachers resource for introducing innovative pedagogies uh, by using technologies. Uh, strong foundation for future readiness. Again, again, major challenges are, you can say, proficiency level in language and maths for all grades, as you have mentioned in your presentation also. Uh, Enrollment of children with pre-schools, uh, pre you can say 57.5% of uh, grade one children without pre-school experience. Even you can see Karnataka, 10.32% uh, of children having, uh, not having uh, pre-school experience. So ICT infrastructure is very much important with the labs, digital boards, electricity, internet. Uh, these are the, uh, you are talking about library and sports material, but still uh, these are the great luxury and facility for many of the uh, schools uh, in India. Gaps in coverage under vocational education. Uh, so future readiness, uh, certain subjects, skills, and capacity should be learned by all students to become good, successful, innovative, adaptable, and productive human being. That is the, our topmost priority right now. So. The new, new education policy is talking, the main function, main uh, importance of uh, uh, skill for future readiness is foundational literacy and numeracy. Why? By creativity, scientific tempers, communications, health and nutrition, 
digital literacy. So again, innovative practices from states, we can see in uh, this uh, uh, report. I will skip that. But way forward, action to be taken by states again. So holistic learning. Teach in mother tongue. Track competencies, skill, and abilities of every child. Reduce curriculum. No silos between curricular, uh, uh, curricular areas and to between government department. And there should be multi-dimensional holistic assessment. Uh, second is foundational learning. Invest more in lower grades. Reading is the key. So NISTA, train 100% uh, teachers. Diksha, use available resources to augment uh, digital and physical infrastructure in, uh, in schools. Uh, deeper and experimental learning leverages the potential of technology available. Uh, we have already seen that uh, there are so many TV channels uh, uh, now while using innovative pedagogies, uh, preparing, engaging high quality content in mother tongue, local, regional language for all digital modes. So peer learning, uh, buddy system in Chandigarh and Navadeva Vidyalaya are the best examples when we can uh, uh, give example, collaborative learning, institutionalized peer learning, group teamwork and collaborations. Skill-based learning, introducing and integrate certain skills and capacity in all grades, including IT and new age and industry skills. So this report is not, uh, not only talking about the major problems, they are also talking about the way forwards. And priority areas for state duties, uh, like foundational learning, skilling, uh, and use of technology. So 100% energized textbooks with QR codes tagged to e-content. Mother tongue, that is the most important uh, part of uh, foundational learning, regional language as medium of instruction. Performance grading index, uh, you can see so many scores, like this is a tool designed uh, to provide insight on the status of the school education in states and UTs, including key levers that drive their performance and critical areas of performance. Uh, so we can see the 36 parameters it, is, it has highlighted and uh, outcome and governance basis, learning outcome, access to education, infrastructure, equity, teacher education and training and governance process, which I have already mentioned and uh, on the basis of the structure of state uh, uh, PGIs, we have seen uh, so scores of uh, states, small states, big states, UTs and states. So I stop here uh, where this report is giving us uh, uh, insight of all these scores. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is gonna be like a couple of comments in my understanding of India. And I'll try to frame it into a question. <laughs> I feel like there is a lot of digital illiteracy in India, not infrastructural support in rural areas, access to digital devices and cost of data in all the rural areas is very, very low and the cost is very high for how much they make there. There's inadequate skills for people who live in those rural areas to access phones and technology-based products. There's a big language barrier. 85% of India does not speak English, but the phones are in English, essentially. So I feel like a big, and I'm, I really appreciate everyone who's put in their thoughts, I feel like there's a big gap in what India needs and what everyone's talking about. Every, the only solution I hear from each one of you is how everything should be digital. And you know, there's, I, I'd never, besides Mr. Pavanji's uh, presentation, there was a lot of talk about, you know, how there needs to be a found, like foundational change in how schools are, you know, how there's a change in schools essentially. So also like, the previous session, there was, there was Mr. Harshul, I think, or Hansul from Tech Mahindra, and he was talking about how they want to upskill people and how they want to make people skillful and not knowledgeable. And he essentially said that thing, and I feel like that's a disaster for India because you know we don't want to upskill people; we want to educate people. And there's a huge difference. I'm going to quote a line from one of my favorite films, where a lion's going to jump in a chair every time you whistle, but that doesn't mean he's educated. That means he's well trained. So are we training people with digital or are we making them educated? Because I feel like with this whole digital and digital overtake in every field that we are seeing, I feel like we're training people, we're not educating people. An Uber driver knows how to use a phone in India, but he doesn't necessarily mean, know what the slide means. He just knows that it's gonna result in a functional change on his device, but he doesn't necessarily understand what it does. So do you think there should be any other change besides this huge overtake of digital because I feel like India is not ready for that. So digital or no, because that's what all the startups here are doing. Yeah, so, so I'll respond from our perspective as implementers. I actually don't think most foundational literacy yes. programs are focused on digital. That's not true, actually. Most nonprofits that work in that space actually use hard copy books 
we use much more than the digital space right now. Because as I was noting, most schools don't have access to computers. Most schools don't have access to the internet. So that's, I think, you know, let me start with that point. Going further than that, we also have to be conscious of how the world is changing and what kinds of technology evolutions are happening. It's not always internet-based, and that's why we were talking a little bit about radio. In our portfolio, 70% of our kids have access to radio. So there were opportunities during the pandemic to have lessons through the radio with hard copy materials accessible to the child. There were opportunities to use the mobile device, but for things like parent support, like the nudging that Arundhati was talking about, where a parent who wasn't literate could get a video message on how to support their child to read at home. So I think many of us are very conscious mm -hmm. of the fact that the children we're working with do not have access to digital technologies. So our first jump is not, especially during the pandemic period, it was, it was very clear. You couldn't just access um, digital technologies as your solution. We had to take books out on camels, books out on boats, books out on you know, tuk-tuks, right? Everything that we could to get into communities. And that's the reality. And infrastructure has to be seen for what it is, and you have to evolve with that. So I think on the foundational learning space, actually, that's what most practitioners are saying. You don't want to miss the generation you have now looking for the generation that's going to have access to the internet in the future. And I'm, you know, we say this a lot at Room to Read in the history of the world, no one had trouble rebooting a book. Right? So you can, you, can, you can make sure a child is learning right now. Right? We know how to teach reading. Most of my comments were about how to teach a child how to read and what, what a child needs. I don't know if others have comments on the technology space and sort of that evolution. I, I didn't touch on it so much. I mean, because the panel's focused on that foundational numeracy and literacy, which is really focused in the young, young grades and in mother tongue and text. So that's sort of what we were talking about today. But I think as they get the foundation of the basic skills, right, those basic skills will help them throughout life and throughout the rest of their schooling. So one of the things that USAID is working on is we do a lot in the digital literacy space. Um, I talked about the parents. It's really important. The parents don't have these skills either. So we're working with a lot of um, micro, small, and medium enterprises to also teach liter digital literacy, business management skills, business development skills. In turn, their student, their children are also learning because we're promoting that sort of shared space and we're introducing into educational systems digital literacy at higher grades. Yeah. Pass, it, it, we're just focused on the foundation today, but we're talking about digital literacy because as we know, in the, I mean, that's the future of the world, so it's extremely important. So it is an area where we're trying to look at. Um, I visited school in Varanasi recently that was able, in the previous session, they talked about the CSR law, and those that aren't familiar, there's 2% of um, corporate social responsibility money that has to go back to communities. And I visited a school where we're doing the foundational learning, but they were able to tap into CSR funds to expand into solar rooftops so their school is solar powered and they have a whole computer lab and we're able to get cell phones to start teaching digital literacy in that primary school. So that's happening, it just, it needs to be documented and then scaled up, expanded and scaled up. But so, I just that, add sorry. one point that I'd say in fact the scenario in, in Bangalore is that all of the ed tech startups that very opportunistically jumped on digital They've seen the biggest downturns in terms of valuation and users and all that. So that's not, if you just do it for the wrong reasons, that this is going to solve some problem without investing in the fundamental systems that it yeah. takes for problem solving, you're not, you're, you, you're not going to see long-term change. So at the cost of reputation, again, I'm uh, uh, mentioning that the framework, basic framework for foundation literacy is educational infrastructure, access to education, basic health learning outcomes and governance. So basically all those parameters are to be uh, seen in a, a particular manner so that uh, uh, one can uh, go through those scores which uh, I'm talking about like states have uh, achieved. So I think we have time for one more question. Go ahead. I see your hand. Hi, I'm, I'm Dhaval, uh, Stanford Computer Science alumni. Uh, I had a question with respect to your presentation, Pavan, um, and anybody else has thoughts, please share. Um, so there must be some best practices that come out of your uh, research with the states, right? All this work. Even Delhi government is doing some innovative stuff, apparently, right? Sisodia is focused as an education minister also, one of his portfolios. So are there some exchanges of best practices, some partnership to learn from each other and do so, the best for India? 
so on the basis of the uh, presentation i have seen best practice i have shown best practices for school for children and for teachers transformation so uh, and you will see the scores also daily uh, particular on the basis of the five six parameters and the best thing is that all the states are competing with each other it is not only about daily uh, Ladakh is learning from Karnataka, Karnataka is learning from Andhra, and Andhra is learning from Delhi. So it is not like that key one particular framework is for then one particular state. It is like everybody is working for the, uh, for, to achieve the uh, foundational literacy. Yes, please. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed our panel. Um, there is a lot happening, as you can tell, in this space, and a lot of different perspectives on those that are working in this space, a lot to be done based on the scorecards that are mm -hmm. coming out. But you know, my only request, I guess, to all of you and anyone interested in education is let's not slow down. There's a lot that needs to be done. <laughs> and thank you all so much for joining us. And I'll hand it back over to Thank Kevin. you. And if you could just stay here, uh, I'll request Dr. Debroy to make his comments uh, sure. on the session mm -hmm. and the learnings uh, from the report and his views uh, on this. And what does he think about it? So you have about six minutes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there are issues connected with foundational learning. And there is the specific of this particular report. They overlap, but they're not quite the same. We've had a very rich discussion on issues connected with foundational learning. This is the second report that the Institute has done, the Institute for Competitiveness has done for the Economic Advisory Council, which means that we are aware of what is in the report and have vetted it after a fashion. I should also quickly point out, because of what you said about digital and access to computers, that this report is very unusual. It does not presume the Economic Advisory Council has access to a computer. So the foreword is completely handwritten. <laughs> when you look at a report like this, or if you're trying to write a report like this, <clears throat> essentially, you are trying to identify a set of variables. You're going to try to weight them. And then you're going to aggregate them into an index. And there is a data source you're going to use. The data source is pretty up to date, except the major data sources, all the data sources, are from right in the midst of the pandemic. So the pandemic was a shock. How that has affected the data sources and how that has affected the rankings, we don't know. We will have to wait and see. And this is the second time the suit has done it, so presumably it will continue to do that in the future. In terms of including indicators, there is always some subjectivity. If this is foundational learning, and if I'm including infant mortality, should I include anemia amongst the mothers? Should I include institutional delivery? If I'm going to include expenditure on education, is that going to be irrespective of what that expenditure on education is on? For example, if there is a state which increases the wages as in salaries of school teachers, does that lead to any improvement? In other words, there's always subjectivity in choosing the indicators there is also subjectivity in choosing the weights and therefore in aggregating and getting the index. What is therefore important is to test for robustness and not get fixated on the rankings. Instead, you will find that all the states are in neat clusters. Within a certain cluster, whether a state is number one or number two, it doesn't really matter. But quite clearly, there are certain clusters of states that are doing well and states that are not doing well. What is also important is with that constant methodology to track the improvement of a state over time. 
And because this is the second time the Institute has done it, you will find a page which is devoted to how a state has improved or has deteriorated over time. Foundational learning is only one part of the educational silo. So once we are talking about education, it's a moot question of how much I learn by just focusing on the foundational part of it. Should I actually separate it out, as someone has said, between the Anganwadi part of it and the primary, pre-primary part of it, because these are dealt with by separate units within the state government. But I thank the Institute for Competitiveness for having done this study. I hope they will continue to do this year after year so that we can not only get a snapshot of where states are at a certain point in time, but we can also gauge improvements over time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.